I don't know about you, but I don't have time to spend all day in the gym. Honestly, I don't have any desire to spend all day in a gym either. Ever since having a kiddo, I am always trying to find ways that I can improve my workouts or get the most out of a workout or the most out of my lifestyle in general to get the best bang for the buck. If it makes a workout harder or more effective in a shorter amount of time, then I'm all for it. And I want to introduce to you some interesting research and science in the world of biology that's starting to show how we can get more out of our workouts in a very easy way and even improve our protein synthesis too. Hey, if you haven't already, make sure you hit that subscribe button. That subscribe button is going to get you three videos a week on Tuesday, Friday, and Sunday at 7 a.m. Pacific time on the dot. And also, make sure you hit that little bell so you can turn on notifications whenever I go live. Also, make sure you check out HighLeat.com for the latest and greatest deals on awesome apparel. So what I want to address is something known as heat shock proteins. And heat shock proteins are something that are a response to stress within our cells. Now heat shock proteins essentially got their name because they are a response to heat shock. So if you expose yourself to extremely high temperature, you have an increase in heat shock proteins. But what they're finding is that these heat shock proteins aren't just elevated during episodes of high heat, they're elevated whenever a cell is under stress and they're highly reserved. They're basically set there for only when the cell is under stress. And when the cell's under stress, these heat shock proteins are released and they do all kinds of amazing things when it comes to protecting the cell and helping the cell rebuild properly. You see, when we're building a cell, when our body's formulating all the proteins to build a cell, we have what is called the folding and unfolding of proteins. So if you look at a cell, there are different folds of proteins in it. And these heat shock proteins assist in the proper folding. So they assist in the proper building. They're like scaffolding for the cells. So they're very, very important. But again, what we're finding is that these heat shock proteins are elevated during exercise. So as our bodies are forced to meet the demands of exercise, these heat shock proteins elevate and protect the cell and they allow the cell to recover even faster. So when we're working out, we're exposing ourselves to massive decreases in blood flow if we have a lot of contraction of the muscle. We're also exposing ourselves to decreases in glucose, and we're exposing ourselves to all kinds of other chemical reactions and lactic acid and other things that cause a chemical imbalance. This is stress on the cell itself. So these heat shock proteins are there to help the cell acclimate, which is great, but there's also another benefit they have when it comes down to helping us build muscle. You see, more often than not, we think that muscle building is all just about the protein that we consume and simple protein synthesis and all these really basic things and consuming more calories and yada yada. But the reality is research is starting to show that there are these little teeny things that are going on at the cellular level, even in the actual muscle group that we train, that make a huge difference. You see, heat shock proteins do something known as chaperoning. And it's just like the word implies, chaperoning means the shuttling of a specific nutrient to a specific place. So when these heat shock proteins are elevated, it's their job to help the cell recover. So in the case of amino acids and protein, what they will do is they will reach out and they will grab the proteins and amino acids and bring them into the damaged tissue. So let me give you an example. Let's say that you just trained your quadriceps really hard. Maybe you just did a bunch of squats, okay? Well, you're gonna have an elevation in heat shock proteins. Then you go and you consume a protein shake or you have your protein or do whatever it is that you do. Well, what's gonna happen is the heat shock proteins are gonna see the amino acids floating through the bloodstream and they're gonna reach out and grab them. And they're gonna chaperone them to where the damaged tissue was. So those heat shock proteins literally, just like the word implies, they chaperone the amino acids and shuttle them over to where the tissue that needs repair is. This is really cool stuff. In addition to that, it does some really cool stuff at the genetic level too. It helps what is called gene expression. And gene expression is where we actually build a cell properly. So you may not realize this, but when you work out and you rebuild muscle fibers and you build them stronger and you build new muscle fibers and yada yada, sometimes you have muscle fibers and cells that are built in a kind of a dysfunctional way. You see, gene expression isn't always accurate. At any given time, you have a number of cells that are created that are mutant. They really shouldn't have been created at all because they ended up being created in a dysfunctional way. So these heat shock proteins actually provide an accurate scaffolding so that cells can be built properly. And when you're talking about building muscle cells and muscle fibers, you want good quality muscle cells that are gonna be there for a lifetime. You don't want funky ones that are gonna end up just withering away and going away in the first place. So this is why it's very important to train the muscle properly. So we know that overall exercise stimulates heat shock proteins, but what good does that really do us if we've been having it happen all along and we don't use any new science to our advantage? So what I want to do now is I want to help you understand a way that you can start to train or a little thing that you can use an adjunct to your existing training to start getting more out of these heat shock proteins and start leveraging science to your advantage. 
So this first study was published in the Journal of Sports Science and Medicine, and it took a look at cyclists. And what I wanted to look at was the concentric action. So what the concentric action is, is for example, if I were flexing my bicep, or if I was picking up a dumbbell, when I'm flexing and picking up the dumbbell, that's the concentric movement. This is the concentric movement. When the dumbbell is overcoming my bicep, that's the eccentric portion. So what this study looked at is it looked at cyclists going uphill, the concentric action on their overall leg. Okay. Now, it didn't just look at muscles in their leg. It also looked at their heart muscle and also looked at tissues in their lungs and in their kidneys. But they wanted to measure what the overall increase in HSP 70s were, so heat shock protein 70s. Now, the number at the end is really just the molecular weight. Ultimately, it doesn't really matter. In this case, we're just talking about the most popular heat shock protein that's measured. So what they found is that after exercise, there was a 75% increase in heat shock proteins in the calf. Obviously, the calf is heavily used in an uphill cycling ride. So in this case, we found there was an increase in heat shock proteins. Not a huge, huge increase, but enough to definitely prove that there's going to have to be some adaptation to occur. But let's take a look at what happens in another study when we look at the eccentric phase. So this study was published in the American Journal of Physiology, and it took a look at 11 males. And these 11 males, what they had them do was go through 300 repetitions of maximal eccentric contractions. Okay, they wanted to measure the amount of HSPs in the myofibril, so a particular part of the muscle fiber. They wanted to look at what happened with these proteins in the muscle cell right then and there. So what they found was pretty interesting. Okay, they did muscle biopsies at 30 minutes post-exercise, but also at 4 hours, 8 hours, 24 hours, 96 hours, and 128 hours post-exercise. And they wanted to see if the heat shock proteins stayed elevated. They found at the end of the exercise that there was a 15-fold increase in heat shock proteins in the muscle that was acted upon. 15-fold. And then, in the subsequent four days, there was still a tenfold increase that remained. So there was a huge increase when you focused on the eccentric contraction, a huge increase in these HSPs that chaperone proteins and amino acids for proper growth in a truly genetically efficient and accurate way. This is powerful stuff. Now there was another study that found that literally just after one session of eccentric contractions at a submaximal level, there was a 1,064% increase in heat shock protein 70, HSP 70. So again, we have proof that the eccentric contractions elicit more of a response on these heat shock proteins. So what's my whole reasoning behind all this? Well, my reasoning is that there's so much fluff out there that tells you you need to be consuming more protein, you need to be doing this, you need to be eating this much calories, don't you dare fast because you'll lose all your muscle, don't do ketosis because you'll lose all your muscle. All that stuff just doesn't matter as much. There is so much going on at a cellular and a biological level that doesn't really have to do with the typical stuff that we're hearing about, the calories in, the calories out, and all this and that. You see, what we have to factor in is what kind of workouts are we doing? So how can you start adding eccentric movements into your workout without completely changing the entire course of what you do day to day? So just like I mentioned in the last study, there was a huge increase after just one session of submaximal eccentric contractions. So at the end of your workout, all you have to do is go through and do some eccentric movements. So I would recommend each day of each given week, go ahead and pick a body part that you want to do an eccentric contraction on. If you just did a high intensity interval training session, go ahead and finish up with some eccentric contraction pull-ups. It doesn't have to be something super crazy and it doesn't have to be ridiculously difficult, but by exposing your muscle to that eccentric contraction, you are harnessing the power of science to really, really, really leverage the elevation of heat shock proteins that are going to allow that muscle to recover in a faster way. Again, we have to use data, we have to use science to get the most out of our workouts. And it doesn't matter whether you're a bodybuilder, whether you are someone that's just trying to get healthy, someone that's trying to lose weight, or someone that's just biohacking and trying to have some fun. This is a great way to change up your workouts. And it's a big reason why I'm such a fan of time under tension training in the first place. Focus on the tension, on the cell, on the muscle, at that point in time, rather than just how much weight you can schlep around. Because at the end of the day, that's not really what matters. So I know this was a random esoteric topic, but to be completely honest, this is the kind of stuff that we have to learn about. So as always, keep it locked in here on my channel, and I'll see you in the next video.